have with me the author of Imprint, Warren's Story, and Meet Me in Mexico, International Man of Mystery, C.M. Scotts. C.M. Scotts. Scott, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. So let's start off with your book, Meet Me in Mexico. What's that all about? So Meet Me in Mexico is a, a traveler's journey, and it takes place from um, basically the economy crash, if you could imagine, if you can remember back then, to when I didn't have any options in my life other than to get the hell out of here. And what happened was I went to Mexico following some uh, directions from a vague friend. And then the journey just took me through Central America, down through Argentina and back. And what I did was I recorded many of the experiences that someone will experience um, as a traveler, but not a tourist. So okay. when you go through Meet Me in Mexico, you can imagine yourself having all of your belongings in one backpack. You have no credit cards. You have no spouse to, to call. You have no pets. You have no mortgage. And at any given time, all you have to do is go to the bus stop and you can leave. And you can be somewhere new the next morning. So I don't want to give too much of it away, but it is what you would experience and what my experiences were like by simply selling off the things I didn't need, put my stuff in a backpack and hitting the road. Wow. Yeah. So when you say not as a tourist, but as a traveler, what, I mean, describe that to me. What do you, what do you mean? I mean, we've all seen these tour packages that you buy and, you know, you get a sandals and then you get to go, you know, or you go on a cruise and, and uh, you have guided tours and everything. So, so what do you what are you talking about when you say that? So, as a tourist, a lot of us think um, we think of a Hawaii or we think of a Cancun, a place that has a resort where you have a room that has a room cleaner, it has a shower, a locking door, a concierge. You're basically living your same life just in a better environment. The traveler is a person who gets somewhere and has to find where their environs will be. So me, the young guy, I would find the youth hostel. And when I get to the hostel, I would find other travelers and say, where should we go? What is there to do here? Mm -hmm. But we don't have someone selling us this package where we have to follow the tour guide like a row of ducks. You're on your own, you're an adult. You gotta find the map, you gotta find the bus, you gotta find the train. And essentially you have to entertain yourself. But I, there's nothing wrong with being a tourist. There's nothing wrong with with um, enjoying all of the chattels and everything that comes with a resort. But a traveler is somebody who develops this urge to just keep going. Okay. I want to I want to taste the Mexican mole made in Mexico. I want to taste pad thai made by an old man from Thailand, not from the store next to Home Depot. <laughs> and the traveler develops this this need and it kind of becomes a curse you'll notice that in the book is the curse is it doesn't matter if you're in the most beautiful place in the world there's always somewhere else you want to get to okay and that's part of the beauty of being a traveler as well well beauty but it also sounds like you could probably get yourself you know easily screwed at some point in time it's true it's true um in the second book the sequel to meet me in mexico is, um is called don't lick the lionfish. And I'm, I'm making I'm making a joke off of what one of the hostel owners from Cambodia was telling me. And the lionfish, for those who don't know, it's just a super beautiful, uh, poisonous, invasive species. And it's taking over Southeast Asia. So it's eating the coral, it's disrupting tourism, and it's it's um it's essentially the same thing as all the backpackers, all these travelers and all these Russians and all these Americans who are coming, buying land, building a huge building and then walking around in their bikinis. Okay. These, this, they're disrupting their lifestyle. So anyway, you end up meeting people that get stuck. And in, in the next book, I have several examples of travelers who got somewhere that was just good enough. And then they opened up their little market, their little stand and mm -hmm. never left. Oh, really? Like 65, but he's still like 35 in his mind. And um, you get the best lessons. You get the best life lessons from these people. They might be stuck on purpose. They might be stuck against their will. 
but me as the traveler, I can absorb these stories and this information um, as I travel. And then I share it with you guys in the books. Well, that's cool. So it, I, I'm just kind of curious, have you ever been in a uh, situation where it's like, oh God, I have to get the hell out of here like right now? Uh, yeah, a couple a couple more times than I'd like to uh, recount. Is there one you can share with me or or is it all stuff that um, you're booking you don't want to give it away? Yeah, no, 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 I definitely can. So there's this place in, in Thailand, it's called Chiang Mai, and it's a digital nomad hub. So it is the center of the city of Chiang Mai is the old uh, castle, the old uh, moat is still in existence. The castle's all falling apart and now there's businesses and little homes and stuff in there. Okay. So this is like a digital nomad hub. There's people that are digital designers and there's writers and there's graphic designers and there's musicians and there's gringos and there's Europeans and there's people everywhere. And it's Thailand, so uh, there's a lot of party favors that you can get and there's a lot of nefarious activity that happens after midnight. When so you say this, party favors, what are you talking about? We're talking about drugs. Drugs, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the police are super, the community is very accepting of all the travelers because they bring a lot of money, they're cool, they're all kind of quirky and weird. Sure. But the community and the police are also very strict about, you no, know, you can't be bringing any drugs in here, especially from other places. We don't like it. So the city shuts down at midnight and typically the police are still kind of roaming around looking for you, but you're supposed to go home. Like if you have a big white face, it's midnight. Oh three, you need to be home. Okay. So I was out with a couple of the travelers at one of the, the British bars watching uh, the soccer match, which was a very important match for them, but we're playing pool. We're drinking everything fun, everything. And then both of the doors slam down and they lock and the lights go off. And I feel this hand go over my mouth. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm ready to start throwing elbows. What, the, what is happening? And he's like, oh, <laughs> really freaking out. Um, until there was like just enough light coming through the, the garage door where I saw the face of one of my friends. And he's like, just, just be quiet. Just shut up and be quiet. And what, it, what it, I didn't know was that uh, midnight had happened and I was being the loud, drunk ass American talking to this big old story, slamming yeah. my hand on the table because of how good my story is. And the owner came up and put his hand around my mouth. Oh. So we all had to stay in there for like 15 minutes. Then they finally turned the lights on just a little bit and they started letting us out the back door. One, two go that way, one goes this way. And, um, yeah, so we all like slipped out. I'm the last one to go. And they do this shit on purpose because now the cops are like, they're just waiting for me. Like they saw me from the outside. Okay. You know, so uh, like the, the whole neighborhood is full of like little tiny streets and alleys and motorbikes and mopeds. And um, I snuck, as I snuck out, like I stand pretty tall, but I just put my coat down as far as I could. And it was so quiet. I could hear my own footsteps on the street, like high heels. Really? I had to walk about, there's only about 300 meters, like maybe a little bit further, but all the way down there, I'm walking past cops leaning on their motorcycle like this with a toothpick. They're like, I could arrest your ass for so many things right now, but I'm not gonna <laughs> walk past the other cops and they're looking at their phone like, you mean this one? Is this the one that you were talking about? <sighs> so anyway, obviously I made it back safe, but as soon as those metal doors came down, more than once i was like that's it i'm screwed i'm done so, <laughs> but uh yeah so yeah i can share that one with you for sure just bury me face down right that's that's right <laughs> <laughs> i'm a big fan of that yeah yeah cool beans yeah. so you have this new project that's coming out any uh any uh dates on that the uh, don't lick the lionfish I don't like the lionfish. That should be out by December. By December. Um, I'm, okay. at the, I'm at the classic writer stage. If I have all the content in there, all the puzzle pieces are in there. Now I just got to fester and mull over it a couple dozen times until I just snap and I'm like, all right, it's done. And send it off to the editor. So, so, kind of so like, it's almost the end of October, man. It is. It is. And we all, all right. have dates that we set in our minds and it's like, <gasps> it's next week yeah. or whatever. Yeah. 
So yeah, what's your yeah. what's your writing process look like? How do you how do you get yourself ready to write and uh, mm. and what do you have to do to to actually be inspired? I mean, that's a good question. So I've learned a couple things that I cannot do, and that is I cannot travel and write at the same time. Okay. I can't. I just can't put enough energy into one of the two because sure enough, as soon as I sit down to write this thing, the German gals are going to be like, "You want to go to the waterfall?" Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not working. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, so my writing process is typically when I travel, I stare at my phone a lot and I take tons of notes, like random obscure notes that don't make sense to anybody else, but they make sense to me. So like, sure. I'll type in the honor bartender with the thick sunglasses, save. And then as I'm sitting in the bus, I'll be like, my knees don't fit again, save. But what I'm doing is I'm building the content of the chapter. And I can put in the explanations later. I'm just, I will remember the bar, the bartender with the, with the thick sunglasses just because I witnessed it, but I don't have to like, you know, and the, and the bar was brown and I had two gin and tonics. Right. I'll remember that stuff later. Mm -hmm. So I make pages upon pages of notes. And then ideally, um, I'm, I'm one of the travelers that's been nicknamed a slow packer, <laughs> which is kind of funny because we'll get to a place and be like this place, Guadalajara, Mexico, for example, meets all of my needs. The weather is nice. I can get food and drinks. I can afford to live here. People are nice. I got internet, boom. I'll book a place for two weeks, three weeks. And then I'll pretty much lock myself away and I'll take all of those notes and I'll start crafting my story out of all of that. When I run out of notes, then um, I usually either staple them or they're kind of like just, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I preserve all the words as I originally wrote them. Okay. Close the laptop, go traveling again. Okay. So that's pretty much how it works. So have you ever gotten stuck uh, in a place because you're out of money or anything like that and had to do anything to, uh, to get enough cash to get onto the next place or, you know? <laughs> Something yeah, like actually, I, I, I got a, I had a job at a weed store okay. in California because I was in Nicaragua on a place called Little Corn Island, which is a very small island on the east side. And it's much it's much like a Jamaican island. They are Nick. They are Nicaraguenses. They're, Nico, they're from Nicaragua, but they're island people. The okay. dudes have hands that are like they want to wrestle an octopus, you know, they can speak French and German and Portuguese and they can mix it all up. They're just this, but there's no money out there. If you run out of money, when you get there, you fucked okay. <laughs> basically. So there's at that time, uh, there was one computer, the internet totally worked from like noon to about four. Okay. So you're definitely going to get a virus by logging onto this thing. You're definitely going to send spam to your friends, but if you have to get a message back to the mainland, I shot a message to my friend who just opened a weed store. I'm like, he's the only one I know who has cash right now. <laughs> like, like whatever, dear brother, friend, forgive me first. I'll give you my blood, whatever. I got to get out of here. Um, and then I got an email back a little bit later. And he said, all right, I bought you a ticket. You got to come back. And then I started this harrowing journey of there's only one boat that leaves that island. Oh. And. Yeah, yeah, like the, the locals know who's coming and going because there's only one dock and it's about four foot by about six foot long. Like it's <laughs> there's no big boats, there's no <laughs> motorcycles, there's no getting away. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so anyway, you got to. I had to take uh, a small boat back to Big Corn Island, and then you got to take a fishing boat up the Delta overnight, uh, and then you have to get on a bus, which is another overnight to uh, Managua, which is like a dangerous place. And then you got to get to the airport, but everything went well. Um, and then I came back to Sacramento and all of a sudden I worked at a weed store. Like I woke up on Tuesday and I'm wearing this badge with a big green leaf on it. Like, welcome, <laughs> welcome to California. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's not yeah, a bad place to work. It was definitely, I mean, things could have been worse. It could have yep. been like Target or something like green people at the door yeah that would be horrible yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah i haven't resorted to that yet but i'm sure that that's coming at some point in time yeah cool i, I prefer target versus uh walmart but <clears throat> it's, it's slightly better yeah 
still like a still like a close cut without the razor burn. Like ah, yeah, ah, well. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> fine. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit about uh, um, your your grandmother's a writer. Oh yes, and, yes. And you're telling me a story that I'd really like I I'd, I'd really like the listeners to hear about your grandmother and where she lives and everything. So if you can kind of go into that, that would be great. Sure, sure. So my grandmother's name is Emily Frank. And she was originally born in Chicago, born and raised. And the easiest way to imagine her is with the, the cigarette on the quellis air with the very long gloves, Irish red hair, and fiery green eyes. And I didn't know her too much in my lifetime, but the more... I've learned about her. I'm like, man, Nana was badass. <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, I'll fast forward you up and up and like later to in her life, where she's uh, she's pregnant in Chicago, and uh, her husband dies of polio. Ooh, and she's like, fuck this place, I'm out. And I don't know how she learned about Northern California, but she knew that's where she was going. She hitchhikes her way to Texas. And then she gets on a bus to L.A., gets a job in um, South L.A., makes up some money, takes a bus all the way to Northern California, and sets down. Wow. So the whole reason for her destination is Mount Shasta. And Mount Shasta is this place in Northern California. It's about, uh, it's a little over 14,000 feet tall. So it is a, a true mountain that stands completely on its own. And magnetically, spiritually, and geographically, it's a weird place. Weird geographical things happen there. Geologically, um, UFOs have been seen there. Bigfoot's been there. Um, there's a, a portal that you can like transport to Tibet and back. But that's like Old Testament stuff. Oh yeah, dude, that's for real. It's like one of the portals of the universe. It's a real deal. Okay. Check it out. I'm not making it up. I, this, I'm, I'm serious. So okay. anyhow. So my grandmother gets there um, and she meets my grandfather and she takes on a freelance writing career and she has a, I think it's, I, I want to say it's like a 1966 convertible Malibu, like baby blue okay, in the woods. Like she's, this is like in the, in the country, but red hair, green eyes, Emily does whatever she wants. <laughs> so she, so she spent um, a lot of her um, the latter half of her life gathering weird stories, anomalies, strange things that have happened. Uh, people who get lost inside the mountain and then come back somehow blessed by the original Jesus. I don't know if you know that, but there's there's the story varies. So Jesus lives in Northern California. Really? Of course you would. Yeah, haven't you ever seen little statues of Buddy Jesus? He's been over here the whole time. Oh, yeah. no, I, I, I didn't know that. Transported, transported from like the Vatican to like what is now LA, something portals, probably some aliens and some magnets. I'm not sure, but he, he re just retired over here. He just left. We're better than California. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so anyway, um, a lot of the stories are in light because there's just they're completely infeasible, or, or you know, the ones are very, very real. So my grandmother passed away before she published this book. Okay. And um, my mother and her siblings took it upon themselves to get the book published, edited, and get the covers and photos and stuff in it. But that was about 20 years ago now. So um, my mother and I have been. Or, or have been taking California, the Mount Shasta, California's Mystic Mountain, my, Emily's book, um, and giving it a new face and a new cover and some new updates. So that's just a relaunch. And okay. uh, it looks pretty cool. The cool part for me was I got to take all the extra stories that didn't quite make it in the book. There just wasn't quite enough information about the old lady with two teeth who had all the gold coins. Okay. But I get to keep it because my grandmother wrote it. This is organic material. This is raw source organic material on written from a fucking typewriter. Click, 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 click typewriter. <laughs> and I'm holding these 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 semi manuscripts like these. This is the stuff. Uh, 
a plethora, like a glut of just cool, short, quirky, weird stories. Mm. So like one of my fun projects is trying to weave them into a, what I like to call Twilight meets Harry Potter times Battlestar Galactica, maybe. <laughs> uh, it's very, very strange, uh, but it's very fun because who else has this raw source material of a weasel that broke into a mountain to steal the pearl, which unleashed the black death of the mountain. Like, Really? The story's half written, man. So huh. I'm going to do the co-write, and I'm going to make sure that my Nana's name is on there. Oh, yeah. But we'll see where that one goes. That one's just all pure fun, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the weasel that goes into the mountain, breaks into the mountain, steals the pearl, and unleashes the Black Death. Of course. So you think, yeah, it's easy to think about, like, these big, powerful animals, right? Everybody's like the majestic wolf and the, the bald eagle and, and whatnot. But there's like secondary animals too. Sure. You know, there's like there's like the king and his court, and then there's like some thanes and some dukes, and they can cause some some havoc, but they're not that powerful, but they can cause a ruckus, you know? Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the king has to be like smash. <laughs> <laughs> so the weasel is a fuck, he's a weasel, you right. know? And uh he sneaks into the mountain because he doesn't he doesn't like how the weasel is being treated. And he's like, I'm small and skinny and smart. I'm going to go steal the pearl. And then when he steals, it's not, it's going to be a pebble. I'm not exactly sure. It might be a crystal. I don't know. Yeah. But he's going to steal the thing, whatever the thing is. Um, and then what that's going to do is that's going to inform the audience that the mountain is actually a being herself. Right. Okay, and so yeah. like, yeah. So now the whole fucking mountain is mad at you. <laughs> it's not like it's, it's not like the cops were like, oh, there he is, get him. It's like the whole city in the mountain is like, kill the weasel. weasel. <laughs> and so, yeah, so like the side story is now he's he's running through the forest trying to not get murdered by all of the the alpha creatures, the wolf, the lion, or the eagle, all of them are like bounty on the weasel's head. Sure. Yeah. So anyway, I get excited about that one because it's fun. Sounds like a family reunion to me. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> There's going to be a little bit of that, uh, that uh, the large meeting, like the grizzly bear. The grizzly bear is friends with the falcon. You know, it's a little tiny, fragile little falcon. Yeah. And the grizzly bear is like this big, monstrous, clumsy animal. But together, it's like, it's like a Batman and Robin kind of thing. Absolutely. You know, falcon is going to get killed. It's that happens somewhere like two thirds of the way through. And that's like the pitfall moment when you're like, fuck, grizzly, bear, <laughs> grizzly bear's plan isn't gonna work. <laughs> so how many times have you uh, visited Mount Shasta? I was born and raised there. Oh, you're born and raised there, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. She, like, my Nana finished or moved up there, I think around in her, in her 40s, I believe. No, it would have been mid thirties. And then that's when my, my mother was born. Okay. My father's family already lived there. And so I'm just, I'm a Pacific Northwest traveling country boy kid from a magic mountain, magical mountain. I don't know. So what really weird crap have you seen? I mean, if you lived there, I mean, you must've seen some pretty interesting things. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen things that I wouldn't say that they're too crazy. Um, I've definitely seen blinking lights, um, some some like very short, straight, high beam lights that are on a mountain. Okay. And I think to myself, like, okay, well, there's just, there's a ski park up there somewhere, and people do climb it, so it's probably just you know some hikers or some campers or something. But then I also have friends who work in the Forest Service and land surveyors and. Google Maps, and there are no trails in there. There are no cabins. There's no reason why a human being would be there. But it would be a great place for like an alien surveillance beacon because it looks out over the whole valley. None of these stupid humans can get to it and mess with it, you know? So they just come do some recording of the folks mm -hmm. in, the, in the town, and then a cloud comes by, and then no more blinking light. I mean, that's awfully shrouded in mystery, but it's in plain sight, man. Like, I don't know. 
I think that kind of stuff is really interesting because there's a lot of things that we don't understand, don't know. You know, yeah. you know, we 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 tend to think of ourselves as oh, we've discovered everything we possibly can, and then you know you see stuff like that that you can't explain, right. and you know that's yeah. where the uh, the fiction writers come up with our own explanations, and Absolutely. you know sometimes we're more accurate than the actual damn scientists trying to study things because they're looking for proof, and we don't need proof. All we yeah. need is whatever whatever seems to string together in our minds, and then we write it down. Yeah. I think that's one of the one of the reasons I continue to gravitate towards fiction or semi-fiction, you know, based on real events but fictionalized. For one reason, it just it just comes a little easier to me. Yeah. And and one of the other reasons is that <laughs> there's not nearly as much fact checking. <laughs> like, if, like if you write a fitness book, there are plenty of fitness aficionados who are going to go through that thing and and give it the scruples, you know? Absolutely. And as they should, you know, that's that's their career and so on and so forth. If you write a fiction book about a pebble inside a mountain that comes to life, just, that's it. That's the story. That's what well, you get. Well, what are you <laughs> going to say? I mean, there is no such thing as a pebble inside of a mountain. Oh, there's, bullshit. Yeah, right? Au contraire. <laughs> oh, there's trees in there. Yeah. <laughs> the earth is hollow. Never mind. It's, I don't want to. <laughs> is it hollow or is it flat? Come on. Let's get into this debate. Just kidding. <laughs> Dude, it's totally hollow. It's totally hollow. It makes so much sense. I don't know. I don't know about the, the flat earth thing. But um, yeah. Are, are you familiar with hollow earth? I have read a little bit about it. You know, not, not uh, you know, basically in fiction. You know, mm -hmm. but yeah, I haven't, I haven't really actually heard any theories. I hear way more about flat earth than I have hollow earth. Dude, so what's that all about? I love the story of hollow earth. Okay. And it's very Indiana Jones. Uh, goes like this. The Germans are winning the war, right? They're doing good. They're doing so well that they're sending out exploration missions to go find the things around the planet. Right. So, yep. I don't know who's in charge. I don't know the schematics of the war in Europe, but Germany's doing just fine. And the word gets out that there's a hole in the earth, a big one, a mm -hmm. huge hole. And so the, the Nazis are like, send, get an admiral and send six of our best ships up there. We got to know what's going on. And it's somewhere near Greenland, north of Greenland, in that big mess of rocks and icebergs. The Americans find out about this and they're like, what? No, get Admiral Byrd, one of our greatest pilots, and he's going to get six of his buddies, beat the Germans to the hole. Get, go mm -hmm. figure out what's happening. So, boom, both the submarines and the airplanes are on their way to northern Greenlandish, And then they're both getting closer and closer. They're not communicating with each other. And then all of a sudden, both fleets, radio silence, gone. The Germans are like, how do six submarines just disappear? Right. You know, Americans are like, Canada's right there. They got radio towers all over the place. Something must have gone wrong. We lost them. Terrible idea. Let's go focus on the war. And the Germans basically said the same thing. They're like, that's a terrible loss. Let's go focus on the war. But what happened was the submarines and the airplanes found the hole, the portal, at about the same time tractor beam some sort of suction device i'm not sure mm -hmm. but both fleets <clears throat> sucked into inner earth which is basically eden not utopian society but there's plenty of food there's plenty of water there's just clean air it's fresh it's nice people are friendly but stern but accommodating okay the germans were like war sucks I i'm gonna live here and the americans were like war sucks i'm gonna live here and they all just kind of congregated for about a month or two. Everything's going well. And then the Americans dropped two atomic bombs. And the people in inner earth were like, no, 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 closing the door. And so they closed the door to inner earth. And then the Americans and the Germans were both <laughs> transported back to, to their ship in route to their own country so the pilots woke up in the cockpit Just okay the, the, um, the sailors woke up 
in in the submarine like oh shit there's germany we're home and so both the germans and the americans were like debrief what happened where'd you go and everybody told their story and they're like you're fucking crazy you're out of the army you're white listed or whatever they call it we're like you just go live somewhere else now don't tell anybody that shit happened so the hole in the earth is in northern greenland and you'll notice that on the world map it's this huge continent chunk of earth nobody goes there they just put this big block of white over it like oh green greenland's all covered in snow don't don't bother that's because there's this great big hole to eden right over there so do the accounts from germany and uh in the u.s match each other i assume yes oh yeah huh and think about it like if you see a spaceship we think oh it just launched itself way off into the universe no it just went to greenland huh (laughs) (laughs) so the aliens actually are from the hollow earth Oh, yeah. 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 But I think we're kind of being punished right now because they didn't like that atomic bomb shit. You can't be like splitting molecules and atoms. That's too much. Huh. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if they have that much technology, they can do that themselves. You know, maybe it's like maybe it's like giving a kid a firecracker. You're like, well, something's going to (laughs) happen. Yeah. (laughs) A lesson is going to be learned one way or another. (laughs) <laughs> i like that uh, uh analogy from uh, armageddon where you know have a firecracker in your hand and open it <clears throat> you're in an open hand it just hurts close the hand and uh, your wife's going to be opening your ketchup bottle for you v- for the rest of the life you know type thing <clears throat> that reminds me yeah. of when i was a kid in firecrackers but that's a different story that's so different. what what uh <laughs> what's in the future for for scott what do you what do you what do you plan on you have this new book release coming out maybe december maybe not or whatever yeah. um do you have some more travels plan i i suppose not because of covid but uh when once the uh once we're free again what do you what do you plan on doing um i have a multi-phase trip through europe that i've been planning on for years um and basically it goes like this um there is a trail that goes across the, the northern part of Portugal and Spain. It's the Camino de Santiago. Okay. Mostly flat, uh, but it is a maintained trail, and there are old churches and albergues and hostels that you stay in along the way. And you can hike yourself all the way to Italy. Um, you can kind of poke your way up into maybe Belgium or Germany, somewhere in there. And once you get into the rolling hills, then you rent a motorcycle, and you ride that motorcycle to Switzerland, because I've always wanted to, I don't know what movie it is, but it's some war movie from the fifties where like, you know, James Dean looking guy, excuse me, is tearing ass through Switzerland. And there's this huge like rock waterfalls and cows and beautiful blonde women and whatever, like that moment has been in my head for years. Um, So yeah, so you get to Switzerland and then from there, probably take a bicycle or some other mode of transportation and work my way north towards like Denmark, go see some of my Danish Viking friends in the Sweden <laughs> and then jump a boat over to England. And that's about as far as it, that I've got. So the plan is to do some cycling, some motorcycling, some mm-hmm. hiking, and some train. Cool. And then hopefully I find a castle that I can rent because the third book is supposed to be cooped up in a castle. <laughs> You're going to rent a castle Mexico. to write a book, huh? Well, meet me in Mexico. Don't lick the lionfish and cooped up in a castle is the trilogy. So cooped up in a castle is when I'm like, I'm not really an old man, but I'm kind of done traveling. And the voice will be much more of like, this is what I learned. Sure. But in, cool. yeah. That is, yeah, that is definitely the plan. It doesn't have to be a, monstrous castle that's a lot of work but like, a, like a little castle would be fine a little castle yeah. i've got one of those in my backyard for my three-year-old just saying <laughs> totally might be boring. a little tight for you but you know you can certainly uh castle on the motorcycle be like bam twofer twofer <laughs> it's cheap 
Uh, you know, the new plan right now. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use me for any travel plans or anything like that. That's about the extent of my imagination as far as that goes. <clears throat> Little tiny castle on the back of a motorcycle. What an epiphany. <laughs> <clears throat> hashtag hashtag yeah. I'm first. yeah that'd be good so as for covid and staying inside and writing and all that how did you do with the mandatory now everybody's at home on the computer you should write something you should produce something soon did you did you like the pressure or did no you like i didn't it felt forced and and, and everything that i wrote was crap mm-hmm I it just, it, you know, there's, there's so many things that uh, you pick up during the day with interactions with people and, and, uh, you know, ideas just out of, out of, you know, just normal conversations that's like, oh shit, I could do this. You know, my mind kind of wanders sometimes as I'm talking to people and it's like, you know, and that's, that's where some of my ideas or, or even some of the scenes came from. Once we were locked down and in the house, it seemed like my imagination kind of stifled a little bit. And I really tried to write hard and I wrote, um, I finished a book and then I started editing it. You know, that first, that first brush and an edit. And it's like, this is complete crap. And then I had a different idea and it just, it seemed like, and then I started three projects at once, you know, cause I, I thought I had some really good ideas for my next books. And then, you know, I mean, trying to finish anything has been tough. Now that COVID's kind of let up a little bit, they're not, I mean, COVID hasn't actually let up in Wisconsin. We're like number one in the nation right now for, uh, for infections. Yay. But, uh, as far as the, um, um, it, it feels like it's not as forced at this point and it's taken, mm-hmm. you know, basically four or five months to get to where, okay, now I can write again. It seems like my mind's a little bit clearer now that I can actually go outside of my house and not have to, you know, be caught up in the, uh, oh my God, am I going to catch something and die type uh, mentality? Right. You know, I, I, I found it really tough. And mm-hmm. whereas I listened to other authors, like I wrote 19 books. Okay. I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know. I found a little bit of success with dictating, you know, like if I just have something in my mind and uh, during the middle of quarantine, we were still like allowed to go for exercise, to go for a walk. But all of a sudden, like I have my two, my roommate and his uh, girlfriend, there's three adults in a two bedroom apartment. Like I can't really like get into writing mode and spread my feet out and not take a shower for a couple of days. Like I got to maintain this kind of space. So I found that um, just putting in my headphones with my speaker and going for a quick walk and just like rant it out, I could usually get a thousand and maybe 2000 words of easy content that I just would have said to traffic anyway. Mm -hmm. And like sometimes when I'm cycling during quarantine, like and you have to avoid people, I can hear in the microphone, like the car that went by or the two cop cars with the sirens. And that gives me a little bit of content sometimes when I can, I'm telling the story of what's, what's his face by the bus station and then two cop cars went by. So I'm, I kind of like recorded my environment a little. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wouldn't say it was a total success, but it definitely helped rather than just sitting at the computer, like, come on, words go. I, I, got, I got nowhere with uh, just sitting still. Like I have to be moving. I have to get up. Um, yeah, it does something to my creative button. We, uh, one of the things that happened to us was, or not happened, but uh, we went into lockdown, I think it was March 17th, I think in Wisconsin. On April 3rd, my last daughter was born. Cool. And which is cool. But then again, you know, there isn't a whole lot of sleep happening. There's, you know, all the uh, stress of having a, a new kid. And, you know, that coupled with being quarantined, it was, it, it's been tough to actually come up with, with words that, that make sense, you know, at times, yes. but, uh, you know, I, I like to think I have a whole lot of content built up. I just need to fix it. Yeah. It's all in there. I'm, I'm a big believer in that of whether it's painting or, uh, maybe not like construction, but any kind of like creative venture, like writing and painting and, and uh, hands-on clay stuff, I'm a big believer in just get 
get it out of your mind and through your fingers and edit that shit later. Just, yep. you know, even if you're thinking to yourself, oh, this is garbage. She walked through the front door like, oh, you're terrible. Just keep going. <laughs> and one, one thing I noticed that actually helped me uh, was I will write to myself as I'm writing. So I'll be like, and then Susan walks through the front door, parentheses, Scott, this is fucking boring. Close mm -hmm. And then here comes Steven. And so when I go back and I read it again, I it makes it easier for me to go, ah, I can delete that. It's, right. it's not, I know that I was in a bad headspace at the time, instead of always trying to be like B plus, A minus, gotta be good, gotta be really good. If it's garbage, it's garbage, you know? It's funny. I use hashtags. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> TBF to be fixed. Mm. TBF. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Making notes, making notes to yourself is uh, pretty fun. When I, because I, I use Evernote on my phone or on my oh, computer. Yeah. I do too. Yeah, and that's yeah. you can definitely sometimes just like click over like what what was I writing about that day and you're like oh that totally goes over here. Yep. So, yeah, that part's yeah, beneficial. I use that too. Uh, <laughs> TRS is my other one. This really sucks. This really sucks. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's funny is I'll notate that in my writing and then I keep going for another 2000 words. And it's like, this whole thing sucks. I don't know why I started, uh, you know, but at some point in time, you know, you can take little pieces out of it and, and yeah. add on or expand on it or whatever. It's just the ideas that, uh, that get written. And then it's almost like it, it kind of gives it some permanency, you know, as far as, you know, it, 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 it's a formulated thought at that point, you know, yeah. whether it be good or bad, it's, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think the throwing away or com throwing away some notes or, and compiling my notes is kind of like restarting the computer. It's, it's kind of like clearing the cache for me sure. in my mind. I'll be, I'll have a bunch of notes where I'm like, Oh, there was that thing about the kitten and the ball of string, but yeah, forget that. <laughs> and there's something about it. There's something about it when you see the old movies from the eighties and I guess they're not old, but there's always like the struggling writer with the pile of crumpled papers over here. Mm -hmm. That's totally a therapeutic thing. It is. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Next. Is. You know, how many times have you sat down when something pissed you off in real life and just wrote about it? Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. <clears throat> that one, especially things in the workplace. Yeah. There's one, there's one book that I'm, I'm still working on, but it's, um, it's called the shiniest goldfish. Okay. And the tiniest goldfish in real life is the one in the bowl that always swims at the top and everyone says, oh, look, that one's so pretty. And that's yep. the one that does the tricks. And that's the one that everybody wants to see. But at the end of the day, the shiniest goldfish eats the same flakes as the bottom feeders. Mm -hmm. And so there's two genius fish in here. The bottom feeders are putting out less effort and getting more food. And the shiniest goldfish is getting the most attention. So be wary when you're in the workplace because a boss is going to see the shiny goldfish in you. And he's going to say, hey, you're really good at your job. Could you help us out with this marketing project too? We're not going to mm -hmm. pay you anymore. Right. But could you help us out with this? Oh, you got really good at that marketing project. Cool. Can you be responsible for this now? And um, we're going to have this email list and this group fundraiser. Can you run that too? And you feel you get all this attention, all this importance, but your paycheck hasn't gotten any bigger. Right. Be wary of being the shiniest goldfish. Well, and how many times has that happened where all of a sudden you wake up one day and you have more load than you can handle? You have too many things going on. You're overly stressed. You know, life all of a sudden sucks. And it's because that damn boss is like shoveling shit on you because realistically, they just want to see what your capacity is. And then, you know, give you 10 more percent and, and see if you actually do it or fail. And yeah. here you are, you know, you're working your 40 hours plus another 20 hours at home just to keep up with, you know, so you can kind of impress your boss who is an asshole in the first place for not realizing that, you know, you're not just a resource, you're a human being. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it, it's the nature of, of being a boss too, though, is trying to solve problems. And when you see one person who's standing out, it's a significant financial cost for the business owner to get a new employee, but it's to their benefit to just be like, ah, Jeff, Jeff, good old Jeff. Yeah. Do you want Friday off, Jeff? Because I want you to be in charge of this project. Right. And that that's their job, managing people. That's what they're supposed to do. So being a shiny goldfish isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's more of just the realization that um, if you're getting paid $15 an hour, that's not a breakneck pace. If you're right. getting paid 25 bucks an hour, you should probably have a breakneck pace, mm. you know? So, see, I yeah. was, I was always the boss. I was, you know, whatever. And so I was the guy that was doling out the, uh, the, uh, all the crap jobs and figuring out who I could lay what on and mm -hmm. uh, go from there. And then after, after dealing with it for so many years, it, it kind of got to me a little bit, you know, as far as, you know, you're wearing out these people faster than, than you can actually hire them. You know, you you, you take them to a certain point and then all of a sudden they're like, screw this. I'm going to get another job because I can't get a life balance. I can't do this. I can't do that. And yeah, you know, basically that's what they're saying. And so then you replace them and, you know, at, at some point in time you get a reputation or you get a, uh, a, uh, a stigma about you that, you know, you're just, a you know, you're running people through a cheese grater and taking yeah. the pieces that you want and everything else. And, you know, the other part is that the boss doesn't always see the bottom feeders, you know, the people that have the capacity to do things and actually assign shit to them and see what they can do. There is, yeah, there is that, you know, that is part of being the shiny goldfish. Everybody gets distracted. Yep. Right? Like what all the fish down here, they, they can, they can do stuff too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, or yeah, the people off to the side. Uh, it reminds me of Chris Rock, I think from the nineties. He had an album and he was talking about minimum wage and he said, you know what minimum wage means? It's your boss telling you, if I could pay you less, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, Chris, yep. that, that, hits, that hits the heart. <laughs> but yeah, Ooh, that's, one, that's one of the reasons too that, that I'm still always motivated to write and keep writing is because I don't know if I'm ever going to write a, a Harry Potter type thing and jump from no name to billionaire. That seems like a long, that's a lot. It's pretty lofty. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's lightning striking. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a, there is a lot of value in just uh, producing something, putting my name on it and publishing it rather than just sitting at home or playing pool with my buddies or playing Xbox or something. So like I might hit something, you know, but in terms of like a, like a therapy during coronavirus or catching the voice in my head when the airplane takes off, you know, or sometimes when the Uber driver drives too quick, this voice in my head just starts narrating my world like Richard Dreyfuss style. Mm -hmm. um, God, 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 catch it. I gotta catch it. Yeah. Um, well, I, so, it's like, I, I think that's important as far as writing goes, because most of us are not going to be, you know, probably the Stephen Kings, not that you can't or the, you know, the James Patterson's or, you know, whatever author that's making, you know, a billion dollars, you're not going to be that, but there are a lot of authors out there and a lot of writers that make a pretty damn good living just by putting out, yeah. you know, they have that output. And if you're going to sit on the couch and say, Oh my God, I can't, you know, I, I just can't, you know, I, I wrote one book. You're not going to make it on one book. You're probably going to have to write 20, 30, yeah. you know, page. and then you have that residual income, but you did it because you weren't passive. You were, and we were kind of talking about this before you're, you're actually getting off your ass and doing something. It's a lot of hard work to get this done, yeah. but you have to do the hard work. Yeah. And you, and you kind of have to take the punches. Like I've been doing this for a couple of years and, and I'll admit the very first project I did on my very own, I had some delusions of grandeur. I was like, oh yeah, so I'm gonna get a couple of sales here. And then that coach from the NCAA team will see my genius in the book, <laughs> call me up and give me a job with, you know, like UC Berkeley or something. Oh and yeah. Of course it didn't happen. Um, but one of the things I've done a couple of uh, like guest lectures for uh, the junior college, the local college. Yeah. Um, and another podcast as well, where the biggest thing I'm encouraging these young folks and these young writers um, is 
the, the publishing process is a lot of a lot of steps. There's a lot of steps, mm -hmm. um, and you can either just be a writer and pay someone to take those steps for you. There's no discredit in that, in my opinion. Um, or you can do every single step on your own. That's totally uh, possible. But you have to finish the writing. You can't sell the book if you don't finish writing the book. You know, so whatever process you have to get it out there, your your first. I hate to say this, but I, I tell almost all my clients, your first book is not going to be good. Mm -hmm. It's okay. The first t-ball game you ever went to, you missed the ball like every time. <laughs> Remember when you were like a kid learning to play soccer and you you, you sucked at it. This yep. is part of the developmental process. So self-publishing, e-publishing, and all of these things get you good at the publishing process and also get your writing skills down. When you produce that really kick-ass manuscript, now you're ready to produce, to launch the thing with confidence instead of like stumbling around. So just on a side note, you kind of mentioned your clients. You do do, you do 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 do, um, <clears throat> there's my vernac my, my prize winning Wisconsin uh, vernacular. Um, <clears throat> you also do author coaching. Yeah, I do. Um, so I found, I found, um, a little, a little wheelhouse, I guess I would call it in, uh, memoirs, helping people who have either just retired or maybe they've just come out of something traumatic, or maybe they've come out of something or finished something that was uh, wonderful and a blessing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and they want to tell this story, but they don't know how to tell it. They don't, they feel like they're a bad storyteller because nobody likes the way they tell stories. And they just, this wonderful story, this humankind, good natured, beneficial story gets stuck inside because they don't want to release it. Right. Um, we're all afraid. A lot of us have that spelling bee type fear of, I, I don't want to tell anybody because I don't want to get laughed at. Mm-hmm. And so what I don't do is I don't coach people in, I don't read your document and give you lots of red marks and syntax corrections and stuff. I could give a shit about that. There are people who lose sleep over manuscript um, commas, syntax, semicolons. I don't lose sleep over that stuff. That's give why it, we have editors. Give it to them, right? Everybody wins. So most of the coaching that I do is a lot more of getting the project defined getting some bulk of the content into the project and then getting it moving. And at that point, I'm a lot more like a personal trainer, not an accountability sense where I'm going to call you if you don't do it much more in a sense of like, okay, you, we got distracted over here because you're worried about Facebook and Facebook ads. Forget all that nonsense. Tell me about the girl with the tricycle. And so I just kind of help them get the story going. Um, and then I help them get it com completed. So I help publishing, I help with publishing a little bit, but I really thrive much more in, Jeff, you're telling me you've been married for how many years and you don't know what it's like to come home late with some whiskey on your breath? Come on, tell me that, <laughs> tell me that story. And they don't want to, because they're like, oh, I never actually told her. I'm like, well, this is the time to do it. So, right. yeah. <laughs> It's, it's a little bit different uh, approach to coaching, but I, I enjoy it because it's not heavily regulated and there's no like timeline. Like you have to send me X amount of words. Um, what I need is I need you to cover the content. I need you to tell me what's up with the girl with the tricycle. Why do you keep mentioning this girl with the tricycle? Mm -hmm. The last thing I need to know is, am I in a good mood when the book is over or am I in a, shish, am I mad at you at the, at the end? Right. Because that's a totally good way to end a book, you know? So, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That is cool. You know, the, the developmental portion of it is something that, that, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many seminars I've been to where they always, you know, they always talk about, uh, well, analyze with a Kalytics report and figure out what genre you should write in, then write in that genre if you really want to kill it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which is, you know, God knows the world needs one more, uh, vampire love story or, you know, reverse harem, whatever. But I mean, those, those authors make really good money on that stuff, you know, and, and once you get into a click, that's really hot or a genre, 
um, that's fine. But what I find is, you know, from my own personal, it's like, I don't really give a shit about that. You know, I just want to write what I want to write. I have these stories in my head that, that hopefully are interesting, but if not, you know, fine, no one will buy the book, but at least I got the damn thing done. And you still got it out there. Yeah. I tried when I was in Southeast Asia, especially when I was in uh, the digital nomad hotspot, I was friends with several other writers and two of them were doing quite well. One of them was writing full on erotica. Just there's no, mm-hmm. no ways to paint it. Like she was writing full on erotica doing pretty well. Yeah. And then the other guy was writing um, romantica, which is kind of like this new thing, but it's like, think about it like the Midwestern housewife. Okay. Right. Alone on the ranch, husband died in a terrible cattle drive accident Mm -hmm. you know when the the bad cowboys come to town the good cowboys come to town but slightly modernized so that it's not like they don't have graphic sex scenes but they have like this this raw emotion and crying and rainbows and all all of this very emotional stuff not Um, crying and and rainbows all all of it all Um, of it wow you can have you can have rainbow if you're gonna have a storm you gotta have a rainbow you know, if you're going to have two guys fighting each other, you got to have two people loving each other. It's it's very emotional as much as you can get. And other than the fact that it was draining for him, he's like, it's really hard to write that much. <laughs> uh, he was making a ton of money in the youth fiction, Christian fiction market because right. he wasn't using like illicit words. He was He wasn't saying there wasn't like any drug use or any murder or anything that was unsafe for the 16 to 12 year olds sure um and he was selling all of his ebooks for like 250 three bucks i think and he was killing it Hmm. so finding like that mini market is is a big deal for a writer but i tried it and i was like i can i can i can can write some erotica right (laughs) no let's try let's try romance it's beautiful flowers and uh, you get a puppy it's happily ever at. This is hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I find I have to write something that matches my soul. Yeah. I really that's that's when it becomes easy. You know, when you try and force it and, and try and write to write to some genre that is not yours. You know, yep. and God bless the people that find that genre, they love it, and they can just put out book after book after book after book. Yeah. You know, but um <clears throat> that ain't me. Yeah. That's, it, that, that part is really tough. It's difficult as a, as a, any sort of creative to see other people succeed at something that you totally think you could do that. Mm-hmm. You know, like you see some of these books and you're like, I could, I could totally do that. Like, it's not that long. The cover's pretty good. You know, the reviews are pretty good. Like, why can't I do that? And the reason you can't do that is because I'm not, I'm not that person. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I can tell my own stories like how I see and interpret this world. Um, but I can't pretend to be James Bond because I'm, I can't write. Uh, Rami Vance told me this uh, when he was helping me, he was on a coaching call with me several years ago. And he was like, Scott, you're a character writer. You're not a bank heist writer. You're not a Russian submarine writer. And as soon as he kind of like clarified for me, like don't even bother with that stuff. Like right. you are terrible at the bank heist you suck at that. Just don't do it. And then I started embracing more of my character writing and my my quirky scenarios. The old lady who runs the taco stand is actually in love with the guy who owns the tire shop. And you can tell because he always throws a tire process. Yep. And that, that's it. I, mean, I can feel it. Like I, I totally, it's like organic, but it feels like it's coming from my soul rather than, you know. And that's when you write something to- meaningful. Yeah. I mean, realistically, I mean, something that, that connects with people and everything else. It's not when, you know, you're trying to rewrite Twilight in your own, in your own version or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's pretty much the deal. Winter's coming. So right. Writing season is kicking in. It is. You got that whole November thing that, uh, you know, uh, Jeez, I can't even remember what it's called. But you know, write a novel in November, whatever that know, challenge right. is. I, I don't do it. <laughs> oh, Nemo, Nemo, nah, Nemo, right? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't do it either. <laughs> yeah, whatever it is. I just know there's a whole lot of authors that uh, throw out, hey, I'm on a writing sprint. Can you, do you want to join me? Nope. <laughs> I'll do my own. Thank you. No, no. One thing that I've been looking for, like as a writer, is somewhere I can go pitch my crazy ass fiction idea, you know? Because mm. uh, I haven't seen a whole lot of movies in my life, and I definitely am not the kind of person who remembers which actors were which and who. Yeah. Was, I don't remember Hollywood stuff at all. But I'll give you an example. When I go out to the pub, you know, pre corona or whatever, and I'm talking to some other person, I'll be like, I have this idea for a story where like the cops are invisible. There's no more judge, attorney, and and um, judge by a jury of your peers. None, none of that. And it takes yeah. place in the future, but not too far in the future. But the cops have like invisible suits. So a little more like Hammurabi's code kind of deal. Like if you steal something and the invisible cop sees you, bam, you're punished right then and there. And so all of the people in the city kind of live in fear, kind of like dystopian. And the people, <laughs> non-writers look at me like, is this, a, is this an episode of Black Mirror or something? Like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, no, this is my idea. Like, I'm, I haven't written the story yet. What do you think? And they're like, I, I, don't, I don't know. So I'm looking for other fiction writers, people who have these kind of one-off ideas. Like, well, I don't want to write Twilight. I'm going to write this. And it, they're, they're hard to find. So I'm throwing that out there to the internet of, of uh, we need a fiction writer's melting pot. Cool. Can we pause for a minute? Sure. All right. Three, two, one. Yeah, that's interesting as far as, you know, getting a bunch of fiction writers together and kind of throwing ideas out there. I mean, that, that'd be kind of a cool group to be a, belong to just, just authors and just, you know, throw your crap out there and see what everybody thinks. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, um, we've, I've been a part of a couple of groups that, uh, you know, authors get together and they just drink and they come up with all sorts of crazy crap that, uh, Oh, I think this would be great. And I actually had some ideas pop mm -hmm. out of that. You know, somebody says one thing and it's like, I could actually do this. And, you know, yeah. but, uh, I, I think, um, I think whatever environment you would prefer would be welcome, uh, within reason, of course. Right. Um, one of the things I'm looking for is some of these people who just have this wealth of knowledge of TV shows and movies. Because I'll be like, yeah, there's like invisible cops and they have they have like money, but it's digitally stored in their skin. And someone would say, ah, no, that's that's the movie with Justin Timberlake. They already did that. <laughs> be like, oh, okay. Well, okay. And so it's, it's not necessarily that I want to change the story in my head, but I don't want to put a ton of effort into this thing and then someone be like oh yeah like they've done that movie three times now yeah i i thought it was funny because i was uh playing around with an idea for a, a sci-fi story and i was just kind of screwing around with it and where you know you could transfer your your uh basically your mind into another body and and you'd live forever and that type of stuff and i was just kind of thinking man it'd be really cool if you could do it like this or whatever and then i watched alter carbon and it's like okay um inadvertently i was totally ripping that off but he had a much better idea on how he did that you know mm -hmm. then i read the book and i'm like oh my god i can never do this justice so yeah put that in the back burner for why i'm a better author because i can't compete with this yeah but uh yeah i had a couple people compared meet me in mexico to uh wild or into the wild okay. Yeah, um, and I, I I had no intention of of mimicking those books, but in a similar sense, it was I'm telling you about the streets of Buenos Aires, but it's definitely not. I'm not encouraging you to come there. I'm not discouraging you from going there. I'm simply painting the picture of how I got to Hector. Hector is the man I rented the motorcycle from with the two pigeons. Sure, you know, like I'm I. I I'm not explaining it as in like, this is what Buenos Aires is exactly like. Um, I, I think that uh, that type of writing is really interesting from the perspective of it's a reality. It is, yeah. it is the, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's not the glossy, 
uh, travel brochure that you get at the, at the agent's house. It's, you know, this is yeah. what this, this is what real life is like in this country, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, to kind of, kind of go back a, a moment when we were talking about, um, clients and clientele in your market and your niche and stuff. I've gotten some reviews from total strangers, people I have, I have no idea who they are, and they totally got the gist of the book. They totally understood that, that this was kind of like my monologue. This is my observations. I met this really, this dude is warped. That's a weird ass person. I don't want to end of chapter. Here's a really cool, happy, brand new, happy couple, whatever. Yeah. Um, so some people totally got it. And then other people wrote me some scathing reviews. I thought this was going to be a story about traveling and tourism and, and the life and the allure of whatever, whatever, whatever. And I didn't get- see this shit at sandals. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so I, at first I took this huge emotional hit, like, Oh God, I didn't do well enough. And then one of my author friends helped me realize that there were two people who just wildly missed the point. And they were assholes and gave you shitty reviews. The right. other people are getting it, you know, mm-hmm. so don't like lose, don't sacrifice all of your momentum because one grumpy old dude didn't get his resort story of the beautiful women at Sandals right. Resort. Like too bad. That's not the story. The story is not that at all. Um, so yeah, so writing to, to your market and your niche, I think it is regrettable, but it's, it's totally true that, People who approve of your work don't say anything. Right. People who disapprove will tell you straight. They'll tell the whole world. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And then you yeah. get that so, that you know it, you really aren't an author until you have a one star review. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And you and you have to have the you have to have the resistance the wherewithal to not reply to their shitty review because on Amazon you can go back and be like, would you like to communicate with the customer? Yeah, I would. I, mean, I absolutely no, would. No, I don't need to do that. That's that's one of my feelings. Um, I, I've done that a couple of times, you know, just responded back, but there are just off the wall comments. Um, mm-hmm. The, uh, the, I won't even get into it, but, you know, I bought the wrong book. Well, why'd you give me a one star? Because you bought the wrong damn book. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I'm sorry your shopping experience sucked at Amazon and you couldn't read, but whatever. You yeah. know, um, my favorite one is uh, your book is just Pentecostal tripe, and I I uh, I'm gonna get a T-shirt that that just says Pentecostal tripe because <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> like that. Yeah. 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 That's that is definitely a growing point um, for authors, and it's it's difficult. Like I've, I've reached a point now where sometimes I'll go to my KDP account and I'll be like, oh, like I've actually completed a number of these and I've helped other people and too, so I have a good grip on this. Um, and then some people will ask you questions that are just, I wouldn't say unanswerable or inanswerable, but you can tell in, in their mind that they are creating reasons not to do it. Right. And like, oh, well, people don't read as much anymore. Like, well, that's the human capacity for absorbing information has not changed the way that we absorb information has changed. Absolutely. People will say like, well, what if I write about my neighbor and then she finds out about it and then she's going to sue me for all that I'm worth. (laughs) And I kind of chuckle at this point because I'm like that in a weird way, that would be like champagne problems because that means you made enough money to be sued worth, Uh you know, like uh, that if you get plagiarized, well, that's kind of like a backhanded compliment. Kind of. You know, these aren't reasons to not publish it. Right. You know, like throwing your family's skeletons in the closet all over the national media might not, might not be a good idea. But like writing a story about your family is a very re- real and true account. Mm-hmm. It's better to tell the story. Exactly. And it's firsthand and it's fresh in your mind and... You know, you have all these memories that you can, you can throw down. And if you want to, you can turn it into fiction. You can make it, you can change the names. You can change all things. You can change some circumstances or whatever and and make it a memoir, but it's a fictional memoir. Yeah. You know, and it's it's very similar to uh, Warren's story. So Warren's story is, is a personal account from my grandfather, Warren. Okay. And 
there was a, a segment of time a few years ago when I was traveling around Southeast Asia, I believe. And I got a couple of messages from the family like, hey, you should come hang out with grandpa for a while. And so he was reaching an age where he's still spry enough to drive to town and back. Whether he remains awake the whole time is the problem. Okay. <laughs> Old man making maps, forgets what he's doing. So yeah. you got to just corral him is all really. Um, and so we we developed this, this story time. And he didn't like anybody to be watching over him, but he loves company. So what I started to do is I started to just turn the recorder on my phone and be like, hey, Grandpa, didn't you say that you were in Pusan? Am I saying that right? That's in Korea, right? And I would trigger these stories, and he would go into old man ramble mode. At Robert, sure. ramble. And the story would go all over the place. Um, and I would record it. So I didn't have to stay super tuned in. I could just kind of like, mm -hmm, yeah, oh, cool. Two bows. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I got all these stories. <laughs> and so the, the project was, um, it was a lot of fun because once his mental state kind of deteriorated, I was able to bring the stories to him and say, and kind of recite the story back to him, even sure. though it's his own story. Um, and it would keep him kind of entertained and fresh and awake and alive. So I don't think I'll ever make a fortune on that book, but it was a really unique experience I got to share with my grandfather and it got to put his words into print, you know? That's cool. Yeah. That so, is, that's totally awesome. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Well, we've been going for a little bit here. Um, yeah. Looking at it a little over an hour. And yeah. you can cut half that shit out. Probably not. <laughs> Makes it less unique. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. Is there anything else you want to say to your audience, your readers, or anybody else that may be entertaining uh, buying your books? Um, yeah, in terms of, of the actual book, um, I'll give you like the honest uh, bar side chat, which is Meet Me in Mexico is a firsthand real account of what it's like to travel without a home. And I originally titled the book Pero Sin Casa because an old lady, an old Mexican lady, nicknamed me the homeless dog. <laughs> but Amazon had a problem with Pero Sin Casa in the title because it's an English book with a Spanish title and it has sin on the front. So Amazon was like, hell no. Yeah. So I, changed, so I had to change it to Meet Me in Mexico. When the almighty Zon says book, no. Yeah. One of the things I encourage in my writings is I'm trying to show other people what it's like. It's totally possible. You can do it. And real experiences come from real travel. You have to throw yourself into the fray at least a little bit. If you want to go to Cancun and you want to take the tour guide and swim with the dolphins that have nicknames, sure, great. That's one hell of a vacation. If you want to travel and experience and test yourself and grow based on what the world has to offer you, that requires a passport and a backpack. So um, in terms of writing, people who have their, their, their right brain creative, whether you're a painter or a collage or whether you do graffiti art or you do writing or poetry or whatever, mm -hmm. um, it is in my experience and in my career, get that shit out of your brain, through your fingers, on paper. Edit it later. Write right now, edit later. And that would just be my advice and my encouragement to humankind. You got a gift. You got to get that gift out of your skull and onto something tangible, paper, canvas, vinyl, whatever. Absolutely. So that's that. I'm a believer, man. Yeah. I appreciate you having me on. That was a lot of fun. Hey, you know what? No problem. I just need to close out real quick by saying thank you for uh, listening to the DI writer podcast. Uh, if you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe. And if you're listening to this on Podbean, iTunes, or anything else, please follow us. Appreciate you listening to this and y'all have a great day.